Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started since we're past um, 530 here um, and not many people have logged in in the last few minutes. So we'll go ahead and get going. So welcome. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that is very close to all of our hearts here at MRBO because it's about actions that help birds. And we obviously love birds. So we're going to talk about seven simple ways um, and you can help birds in your daily life and also highlight some of the reasons that those, th those actions help birds. So to start off with, um, and let me introduce ourselves a little bit. So our work, so we're the Missouri River Bird Observatory and our mission is to help birds by creating better habitats for them, um, working towards sustainable agriculture, which is what feeding the flock refers to, providing bird friendly communities and getting people out in nature and appreciating and experiencing it. Um, and if you wanna learn a little bit more about what each of the, these eggs entails or a little bit more about our work or anything that we're talking about today, you can visit our website, which is just mrbo.org. So that's pretty simple, easy to remember. Um, so that's what we do. Um, who's gonna be talking to you today is me. So I'm Paige Wittick. I'm the education coordinator Hey everyone, sorry, it looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, we will keep going here in just a second though. Hi everyone, sorry about this. It looks like we lost Paige entirely, which could be something like uh, Arrow Rock had a power outage or something likely. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open the presentation on my computer. Just give me one second, if you will. Yeah, we, we have a plan for this, we have a, we have a plan. Okay, so let's see. I got to share screen. Okay. So everyone, I did just get a text from Paige on my phone. She says she lost internet. So um, we're going to work around this here. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, and if, if folks, if you would... Um, please put it in the chat if you if there's any other like if I freeze or lose internet or there's any other technical difficulties um okay so Paige was here um <laughs> just introducing herself unfortunately um and so she's our education coordinator and was the host of this webinar um here is also Zeb Yoko who folks I think can see right now he's our conservation science communicator uh Ethan Duke our co-founder and co-director, and myself, also co-founder and co-director. And Zab and Eith, if you guys could take care of the chat, that would be awesome. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so as Paige mentioned, the main part of our discussion today is several, seven simple actions that you can take to help birds. And you'll see that they really are simple. A lot of them are really fun. Um, but why are we even talking about this to begin with? Basically, why do birds need our help? Um, so there was some groundbreaking um, publications that came out last fall. Um, basically, there was a number of citizen science um, studies along with professional studies that showed that in North America, we've lost about a third of our birds, so about 3 billion birds. Um, less in population now than than 50 years ago. Um, so 30% since 1970, um, a lot of this is based on the breeding bird um, survey, which some of you might be familiar with, but a lot of them, a lot of it's based on a number of different citizen science projects, as well as, as I said, academic and professional projects. Um, so basically, um, a number of different institutes and researchers came together and they compiled many, 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 many studies and, and were able to come up with this very robust estimate of what we have lost. So 2.9 billion breeding birds. So here are some of the ecosystems from which we have lost um, different groups of birds or guilds of birds, if you were so Eastern forests. Arctic tundra, um, a habitat that we typically look at as very, very remote. You know, what could be really going wrong there? Well, it turns out quite a lot of things. Um, Western forest birds, boreal forests. So this is very Northern US and into Canada is the boreal forest. Shorebirds, um, 
folks know these as sandpipers or plovers um, and they use our wetlands and also grassland birds. So a lot of you I think know that MRBO does a lot of work with research and monitoring of grassland bird populations. This is why, because um, as a guild, they're pretty much our most imperiled and declining species. Um, so something to point out, and we get questions about this quite a lot actually. Um, how, you know, people will hear, how can you say that blue jays you know, are declining. We still have a lot of blue jays. Well, we do, um, but they were even more common than they are currently. So here are a few backyard bird species. Um, we've lost one in four of blue jays over the last 50 years, one in three Baltimore Orioles, one in four rose-breasted grosbeaks. I know a lot of people have seen rose-breasted grosbeaks coming through um, and coming to feeders over the last several weeks, and they're certainly a bird to exclaim over. Um, Dark-eyed juncos and white-throated sparrows are some of our most common winter residents, but they've lost about a third of their population in the last 50 years. So, bummer information, and I'm sorry, um, but this is the truth of the matter. We do have some good news, though. Um, some birds are doing well. So, waterfowl, uh, raptors, turkeys. So, and the the neat thing about these guilds of birds is that we can really directly um, connect their increases in population with specific conservation actions. Um, so waterfowl and turkeys particularly um, are enormous successes of the sportsmen community, the hunters and fishermen who, um, who have worked together over, I mean, more than 50 years, over 100 years, um, to really protect the habitats in which their game species depend. Um, and so we've seen an increase in waterfowl and in the wild turkey over the same 50 year time period. Also with raptors, I'm sure a lot of people remember or have read about DDT. Um, the, the US ban on DDT caused the return of our bald eagle. Um, it was a chemical that caused eggshell thinness and it hit raptors very hard because it sort of magnified up the food chain and their top predators. Um, and so things like that, plus there used to be quite honestly, a lot of target practice that would go on with migrating raptors and we put a stop to that. And so raptor populations have rebounded very admirably over the last 50 years. So what causes these declines and what can we do to help? So this is really important and this is why we're talking about seven simple steps that we can do to help. Okay. so. This graph does not include habitat loss. Um, these are what we call direct measures of mortality. So basically, um, as I heard Paige say yesterday when we were practicing this, a bird encounters this and it dies. That's what we mean by direct mortality. Um, habitat loss uh, is a lot more difficult to quantify um, exactly how many birds you know, are lost when an acre of habitat is lost, say. Um, so that's a lot. That certainly is the major underlying driver of bird decline is habitat loss and alteration. So these things are additive on top of that. But the good news is, is that most of these things that you see here in the scrap are things that we can do something about. Um, so let's see, I got to move my little window here. Um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about cats. We're going to talk about windows. Um, we're going to talk about a little about other collisions. Um, and you can see going down this list, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, when you get to ag chemicals, agricultural chemicals, you can see that there is no green graph bar for the United States. Um, that's because this is actually a topic that has been very, very little studied. Um, and again, direct mortality. This is not ag chemicals killing insects, which are birds food supply. This is, this is direct. So we just don't have the studies. Um, and you can see wind turbines down there at the bottom. Um, so that's really pretty good news, right? I would like to point out that um, we've all heard about wind turbines being bad for birds. Um, there was a famous case in California 20 or so years ago called Altamont Pass um, where it was, it was a very, very bad situation. Um, but what has happened is because of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the wind industry has largely worked with wildlife professionals to cite 
wind energy properly. And when it's sighted properly, it's not nearly as much of a threat um, to migrating birds. So as long as that happens, um, we're in good shape. If it doesn't happen, it can be kind of a problem. So, but you can see the relative um, threats and the in the relative numbers and millions um, of of birds that these threats contribute to their decline. So, let's see. So our seven simple actions, and also I think that um, I believe. Zeb or ETH is going to put this in the chat later, but this 3billionbirds.org is a good source to look at. Um, and it'll talk about many of these things that, that we're talking about today. So that was Paige's part, basically. Um, I was the one that was getting the fun stuff anyway, so here we go. Um, this is something that has that has garnered a lot of press, certainly within the last year or so. Um, I remember last spring and early summer, um, bird collisions with windows is something that was in the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times, it was on CNN, it was in the Atlanta um, Journal. And so this is something that a lot of people know about now. Basically, birds don't see glass the way that we see glass. Um, so, Again, from that graph, this is a rough estimate. About 600 million birds are killed annually by colliding with buildings. Um, the most extreme examples of this, where many, many birds hit a building, tend to take place at high rises, but you can imagine that they're far more across the country, across the continent, low rise buildings and residences than there actually are high rise buildings. Um, so most of these mortalities take place, take place at buildings that are five stories or less, not our big skyscrapers that we might often think of. Um, so you'll often hear about lights out campaigns. What happens is that migrating birds as they're flying at night, um, light in our urban and suburban and even rural areas will cause them to become disoriented and they'll actually kind of come down out of migration. And once they're in the urban suburban area or even in a rural area around a home say, um, then they're sort of there for the day. And that is typically when the strikes actually occur. Um, again, there's, there's rare and, and very infamous cases where they're hitting, they're actually hitting high rises as they're migrating at night. But most, um, most of these strikes actually occur during the day when they're foraging around the area. And the reason for this is mainly that they see, um, vegetation either reflected in the window or a window might, they might see through it um, and through another window to vegetation on the other side. So they're transparent. They think, birds think that they can fly through or fly to um, that next vegetation and continue their foraging. So you can see here, this is um, the 3billionbirds.org sort of little icon that shows this. You can see how reflective that window is. That looks like if you're a bird, you can just fly to that tree, right? And continue your day. Um, so there's a number of different ways that this can be reduced. Um, in a residential situation, we tend to recommend these window alert decals. Um, they're attractive when you can see them and you eventually get to where you don't really even see them anymore. Um, so this is something called an Acopian bird saver. Some people call these Zen curtains. They're actually um, black parachute cord that has been um, suspended over the glass surface. Paige is back. Hi. Um, so you can actually purchase these as a product or you can, you can do it yourself. And a lot of, I've, I've seen homes and nature centers that have decided to use this method themselves. Um, they kind of sway in the breeze a little bit. And so birds are at least made aware that there is a um, stationary object somewhere um, in, their, in their field of vision. So there's a number of different um, companies that make these little dots as well. These are fairly time intensive to apply, but you can see they very, very much break up um, either the transparency or the reflectivity of a window. So they're really good to use. And this is just a few of the products that are out there. Um, 
we've done things like taken old, you know, cutouts from ca colorful calendars and, and taped them to our window when we, you know, couldn't get a hold of anything, any of these products. So anything will work as well. What you're trying to do is make sure the bird understands that the window is there and it's not something to be hit. So MRBO, we have a, a project called Bird Safe KC where we're trying to um, stop birds from colliding with windows on a, on a large scale basis. Um, so we have kind of a, a little army of volunteers that looks for window struck birds in Kansas City. Um, the sad picture that you can see there on the bottom left is um, one night last October. So, and, and this is, we, we obviously don't survey every single building in Kansas City. Um, so this is, you know, this, this adds up. So there's many, many cities that are doing this and that have made a lot of progress, um, both with getting business owners to turn out lights, um, to disorient birds less, or to implement some different window treatments. Um, there is a push towards bird safe glass, which is actually um, part of the manufacturing process. Essentially elements are added to the glass to make it visible to birds. Um, and this is being used quite a lot in the state of New York, um, including New York City on all new construction, which means that it'll be far more widely available as well as manufacturers make it. And there's also a lot of aftermarket commercial window treatments. So we're trying to work with some building owners um, in Kansas City that are in some of the areas that are most prone to collisions um, by birds and, and work with them to try and implement some of these solutions. So kind of a sad topic, but something that's like fairly easy to, um, to find solutions for. So that's a nice one. This is also a contentious one, but also a very easy one to find solutions for. Um, like I said, I get all the fun ones. So keeping cats indoors. So what we typically hear is that cats are naturally predators. And that is absolutely true. Um, they are, however, not native to North America. And so they've only been here for several hundred years as a domesticated species, um, came with humans and human settlement. And so our birds and small mammals and small you know, reptiles and amphibians really don't know how to deal with this introduced predator and they're very, very large numbers. Um, so here's a historic distribution, it says, and this is a bunch of different subspecies of the wild cat, which was, domesticated in the Fertile Crescent. We all remember, you know, hearing about Mesopotamia, right? Um, thousands of years ago, the wildcat was domesticated and has become what we think of as our, as our domestic cat, our fuzzy friend. And this is not a great big anti-cat um, campaign per se. In fact, at least one of the people that's presenting today might get Zoom bombed by an indoor cat. It's not um, an anti-cat overall situation, it's that we don't want them to do this, right? Um, our native wildlife simply cannot handle this. You saw the first graph. Um, they're by far, outdoor cats are by far the biggest cause of direct mortality um, in birds in the United States and Canada. So the other like sort of upside is to this very simple solution of keeping cats inside is that the American Veterinary Association reminds us that their lifespan is almost doubled if they're kept inside. Um, and this is because they're obviously far less likely to contract diseases, um, get hit by cars, etc. So like, it's really a win-win situation. Um, and so we, that's, that's one of the very simple steps that one can do. I'm glad you're back Paige, cause it's your part again. Yeah. Hi everybody. Sorry about that. Um, had internet issues. Um, and so Dana, are you thinking I'm going to share the presentation or? Um, do you want to just take remote from my screen possibly? I don't know. Yeah, don't... I don't have the presentation up or anything. So let's see. Okay. Um, so let me. This is what happens when you have internet issues. <laughs> We're all of our preparation has gone out the window. <laughs> well, not really, because we did, we did sort of have a plan. Let's see if I can. OK, no, remote no, control. I, we got it. I wish I could have seen you guys step up to the plate and totally like take over. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah, it says that I have control of the screen. <laughs> okay, so awesome. So I'm talking to you guys about a really fun way to get in touch with like the land more historically in a sense, because what we mean by native plants or planting native are plants that were historically grown in your area pre-European settlement. So before they started bringing plants over and we started planting different things in our yards and things like that. So what was here originally? And what's really cool about that is these plants are like the lowest maintenance you can think of because those plants have evolved to grow there for, for like a long time. And that means they're specially adapted to like drought conditions and different things like that that you can find here in Missouri. And when you reduce your lawn and you plant more native plants, you create more habitat for birds. And with so many lawns out there in the US, think about all that potential habitat. So I think often habitat loss is like this huge issue that's really hard to grapple with, but your own lawn or even just a potted plant outside can make a big difference um, for those habitats and these creatures. So the next thing that I wanna share with you guys is, okay. Uh, I am not able to click to the next slide. Dana, do you mind clicking to the next slide? There we go. Um, and then if you, I'm not sure if you can share the sound and the video um, from your computer, but if you wanna, this is just a short video that shows um, that Audubon put together that just, it's like, a, it's not super necessary, but it's a cute little short video that shows how even planting native plants can be really simple and be really. So um, hopefully you were able to at least, I know I couldn't really hear the sound, but hopefully you saw some of the texts that was in there that shows um, the different uh, things that just like having a small potted plant or like some of the cute birds you can help um, just by reducing your lawn and planting natives in your yard. And what's also great, so if we go to the next slide, <laughs> uh, there's a ton of res resources out there for to help you get started uh, planting native plants in your yard. So if you live in Missouri, you're particularly lucky because I have listed all of these different ones that you can use. So the Grow Native website that Missouri Prairie Foundation has is a great place to start. They have everything you can think of about like where to buy native plants, what native plants might work in your yard. They have like map layouts of different like ways you could lay out your lawn to be all natives, different things like that. The Audubon Society Native Plants Database is great for you to look up if you're like, oh, I'd really like to attract cedar wax wings or maybe blue jays or a more specific type of bird, you can look in there and it'll give you plants that attract that certain type of bird. It's a really great plate, um, data source as well. And then of course, the Missouri Department of Conservation has a lot of resources as well as the Mar Missouri Native Plant Society and the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, all kinds of great resources. And even if you don't live in the state, if you live outside of Missouri, that Audubon Society Plants Nat Database will work for you. And I'm sure if you have similar um, organizations in your state, they probably also have a lot of different resources about planting natives in your yard. And so if we go to the next slide, this is also a great place. If what I'm saying is like a little bit unfamiliar to you and you really wanna familiar si familiarize yourself with why native plants are so important. Um, this book is great. It really lays out how native plants help support native insects and you need the native insects to get the native birds and how really planting natives in your yard creates life in your yard. It maintains that ecosystem. And that can be really fun to experience and see your yard grow and have these different creatures in there. So that can be a really great way um, to get started and learn more about it is I highly recommend this book. <laughs> and I believe that was my last slide. So take it away, Ethan. <laughs> Yay. It looks like I'm uh, controlling this. Here's a, here's a very simple, there, yeah, now everybody can see me as well, but I want you to pay attention to the slides, <laughs> not me. Um, voiding pesticides um, is a great, simple, everyday step. Um, it's very important for birds um, 
And could you next slide it? There. Because look at that. Back again. Because 1 billion pounds of pesticides are applied in the U.S. each year. Uh, most widely used insecticides are called uh, neonicotinoids or neonics. Um, they're lethal to birds and the insects the birds consume. Um, this massive amount that's applied out in the landscape is, is tough because you, maybe you're not dumping that much out in the landscape, but maybe you are putting a little bit on your garden at home, which is something that you can easily avoid. And there's many workarounds for, for common pests of, of the garden. Um, there's some research that's come out that, that's shown like the, that these things are drivers. I'll talk about in a minute here, but um, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an example of why these things are, are creating a problem. Um, so neonics in particular are water soluble. And so, you know, they, they get sprayed out on the ground. Um, they, they come off as, as seed spillage. Um, they're in, oftentimes they're in the seed coating of seeds. Um, so it's a very pervasive thing that's only been used in pretty recent histories. Um, and we're finding more and more evidence of these calling, causing problems, not only direct impact on our birds, but also, of course, is the elimination of a lot of the invertebrates, the, the helpful uh, insects that, that actually do good things in our ecosystem uh, are being knocked back. And of course, most of our birds in Missouri, they're feeding their young just insects. So they're very important, especially this time of year when birds are nesting the most. Um, not to mention all the other effects within the within the watersheds, um, but but that's that's why the, these things are something we want to avoid. And uh, thank you, Dana. Um, the the thing that you can do besides just throwing you know not throwing uh, pesticides down on the ground and, and insecticides out there is making good healthy choices. And this can be a really complicated thing for people. Um, because there's so much information out there, but but if if you try to simplify it, um, just just consider uh, purchasing organic and local food. You know, those are that's a really simple thing. If you can just make a little effort to do that, um, there's more and more often now. There's much better uh, deals out there. It, it used to be a lot more expensive, but it's becoming more affordable. Um, just ask yourself two questions. You know, like where did it come from? Is this something that came from another country that I could get made right here. Um, uh, you know, how, how many resources went into it? You know, like the packaging, you can see that picture down there, all the packaging and stuff that went into that, all the resources that went into that, you know, what kind of human resources as well as natural resources went into that. And if, if you can know where your food comes from and, and feel confident about that, then likely, it's going to be better and healthier for you and for the birds. So along the lines of, of making those simple decisions, we can transition into um, back to Paige parts here because she likes this happy part. Um, and, and, it, and not only reducing pesticides, but I mean, that's linked to um, your being a conservationist consumer. And uh, Paige is going to go into some more happy stuff about about that. Yeah. So um, this one is my favorite out of all the seven steps. I personally think it's the most fun and easy thing to do, um, but that could be different for everybody. So essentially, it's drink shade grown coffee. So a lot of people get nervous because I'll be at events and I'll be like, "Hey, do you drink coffee?" And I think their thing is like, oh shoot, is she gonna tell me that I can't drink coffee anymore because it's bad for the environment or whatever? And I'm like, no, actually I drink coffee too. I drink it every morning. And here's a great way for you to support not only birds, but family um, farmers down in South America. So essentially what it is, is that most of the coffee we drink is grown in Central and South America. And that's also where a lot of our birds that we see and breed here in the summer um, spend the winter time. And most of that coffee that's grown is grown what's called like sun coffee. So they clear cut the rainforest and they plant the coffee um, on that land. What shade grown coffee is, is growing that coffee underneath the forest canopy. So you not only have 
Thanks, Dana. You not only have the coffee beans growing there, but you also have habitat for birds and all kinds of other creatures that utilize that forest. And what you need to be a little bit careful about when you're um, buying shade grown coffee is that some things are qualified as shade, but aren't exactly what you're looking for. So you can see that graph in the middle. Um, sometimes shade grown coffee can be what you see at the bottom. And what we really are looking for are is that uh, coffee that that shade grown that you're seeing at the top where it's almost an intact ecosystem where there's coffee grown um, on the ground and so one way that you can know that your coffee is bird friendly is the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center has a bird friendly coffee um, what is it called certification um, for different ways that these coffees are grown um, and this is by no means an advertisement um, but Birds and Means is one of those um, coffees that you can buy um, that they're one of the, as far as I know, they're the only company that sells only bird friendly coffee. Um, but you can go on the Smithsonian website and there'll be like, where can I get coffee? And you can find all the different coffee growers. Um, I find the easiest way is to just order it online, um, but there it is sold in some stores as well. Um, so it's just a really fun day and like this. So this coffee is not only by being bird friendly. It's not only shade grown. It's also organic. It's fairly traded um, and bonus. It tastes good. Like uh, because of the way that it's grown, it's like ripened slower or something. I don't know. It tastes really great. And I drink my coffee in the morning. So you get to start your day and you're doing one of your seven simple steps and you get to drink delicious coffee and help birds. So I think it's super fun. Um, and a great way to help the environment and support farmers who are doing the right thing, all good stuff with buying shade grown coffee. So that's all I have to say about that. And now we're gonna go on to some possibly less fun topics, um, but still really important. <laughs> so go ahead, Dana. <laughs> you guys <coughs> always give me the non-fun topics. Okay. Um, so this is another thing that I would expect that quite a lot of people that are on this Zoom today um, have at least heard about in one way or another. <clears throat> um, obviously, none of us likes to see things like pictured on the left-hand side of the screen there. It's aesthetically very, very unpleasing. Um, but our plastic problem is also starting to affect our wildlife um, very egregiously throughout the world. Um, you might have seen, and I forewent putting pictures of this on this presentation because I personally find it really disturbing, but you know, there are, are seabirds such as albatrosses that are regurgitating plastic to feed their young on uninhabited islands in like far in the South Pacific, um, far, far from any human habitation. So I think we can all agree that that is not an acceptable situation. Um, so one of the seven steps is to, um, reduce your plastic use. And here's eight ways to do it. And you can see a quote from National Audubon Society. It's really problematic and really worrisome. Um, and I'm in no way suggesting that you lay awake at night thinking about this. Just, you know, have a, have a, a contemplation about it and do what you can do. Um, it is probably impossible to completely cut plastic out of your life. It's very, very difficult. Um, but some things are surprisingly easy and pain-free. So, not using plastic cutlery is one suggestion. So party plastic free, right? We don't need to use red solo cups, not really. It's a funny song, but it's not necessary. Um, not using balloons, which eventually come down to earth. I'm sure that you've probably heard about that. Taking advantage of tap water. Um, <laughs> I was once taught a class by um, a, a, a high up, security guy in an oil company to work in Alaska. And one of the things he said to the class, which I thought was interesting, particularly from the source, he said, bottled water is the biggest scam to ever be perpetrated on the American public. And um, in, in almost all cases, our tap water is safe. And yet we're out buying single use plastic bottles of water all the time for a lot of money too. Um, so think about always having a, a, a reusable water bottle. No need for plastic straws, um, probably past toddler age when um, we need to have sippy cups and be able to, to not spill drinks everywhere. 
other than that, not necessary. Buying food in bulk and reusing containers. Some stores make this easier than others, of course. Get better at recycling. And that's something I'm going to touch on super briefly. Um, so when Audubon says get better at recycling, I would probably say something like just get more informed about it and, and understand a little bit more about what actually is recyclable. Because I, for a long time, thought a bunch of different things were recyclable that turned out to not be. And the recycling situation has been changing um, actually fairly dramatically in the last three or so years. Um, and also as much as i was under the impression that i could recycle like all these different containers only about nine percent of plastics have ever been recycled ever nine percent so it's it doesn't actually work the way that we think it's working so get more informed about that um and then this is something that i know took me and others a long time actually remember your reusable bag um so these are all obviously individual actions that we can take. Um, but I and others would like to point out that um, these alone are not going to stop the plastic problem that is happening to our planet right now. Um, we need to work on things like this. And what this is, is this is a, the, the slang term for it is a cracker plant um, where they're turning fracked natural gas into single-use plastic. And this sort of manufacturing is being ramped up, um, even as we are together on this webinar. And the result is going, the, the stated goal <laughs> is going to be 40% more single-use plastics entered in our economy over the next five years. So 40% more than we already have, which is an enormous amount anyway. So um, in addition to those important individual actions, I would strongly recommend that you become um, more informed on this particular topic because we need, to, we need to stop a lot of this at its source. We can't, as individuals, clean everything up. Um, so shameless plug for an upcoming event um, by us and our friends at Missouri River Relief, Johnson County Community College, and Missouri Stream Teams United is we're working with the story of plastic people. If anybody on here has seen the little movie, The Story of Stuff, which is an animated movie um, that came out a few years ago, it's really cute. The Story of Plastic is more intense, I will say that, um, but it's really, really unbelievably informative about um, the plastic problem in our society and what we need to do about it. And so um, I, I would love for everyone to to watch the movie even if you don't come to our discussion panel um but that's going to be awesome too i'm really excited to have um some of my colleagues that we all have a different perspective on the situation and so obviously mine is birds um but we have folks in the water resources and, and actually in the waste and recycling resources realm going to be speaking as well so um hopefully that wasn't too depressing we can do something about this so i'm going to turn it over to zab who's going to have more fun. It's going to be more fun stuff. So he's going to try to share the screen. Zeb, I think my computer wants to like open a whole system preferences. And yeah, I, I think it wants me to totally take over. So I will just note when I want to go to the next I trust time. you, but I don't know how to make that happen. So, okay. Yeah. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'm going to mute myself and I'll change slides for you. Great. Sounds wonderful. All right, so um, as Dana hinted, I do have a fun topic, and we actually discussed in our practice run that we did do that does, even though it is kind of uh, been a little bit rough today, we, we did a practice run, and we talked about which of the steps actually is the most fun and easy to do, and the shade-grown coffee and bird-friendly coffee is definitely up there, and then watching birds and reporting what you see is probably tied, I will say. They're both really easy to do and really fun and enjoyable. Um, so yeah, watching birds and sharing what you see, which is called citizen science, is what I'm going to talk about right here. Um, and it's really simple. It's just looking outside. Okay. Well, it's maybe a little more over, that might be too oversimplified, because what you will have to do is then, of course, record what you see and report it um, in an easy way. And that makes you a citizen scientist. So the first one I mentioned was eBird. eBird is the, um, the, the main place where people report their findings of birds and bird study. Um, and it's this, the data that goes in there is from uh, anybody that's looking at birds and they, that they report it on eBird. And that 
um, data goes into the reports like this one with the three billion birds, um, it helps generate those sort of findings when we see that there are declines in birds, even if they are common species, there's less than we might expect to see. And then right here, as you saw, zoom into this slide here, um, is a collection of new research coming out. These are nine or so papers that I found just from this year that use eBird data to talk directly and draw scientific conclusions about stuff that is going on in our landscape um, based on citizen collected science data. So the slide just shows a small collection of them and then they're brand new scientific papers that are really informative and they're keeping science moving forward and it's all based on user generated citizen science eBird data um, just from this year. So the next slide will talk about eBird and where you can find it. eBird is of course found at their own website eBird.org um, and then more information about birds can be found at Cornell, also Cornell's, um, I, sorry, I should go back. eBird is a project put on by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They're kind of the main repository for bird science data in the, in the US. And then when you're doing um, eBirding, it's really important that you know what you're recording and reporting. Um, so what you can do is you can go on another Cornell site, which is the All About Birds website, and look at um, more information about the birds in your area to help um, make your eBird uh, science more accessible. Um, eBird can be reported through a free app on your phone or on your computer. You can submit checklists of birds um, either on your phone or you can go back to your computer afterwards if you write them down on a pad of paper or something like that. It's better to at least write it down or check them off somewhere when you're looking at the birds than to try and think back to what you thought you saw earlier in the morning. Mornings can blur together. I know every once in a while if I just go, you know, sip on my bird friendly coffee sitting on the porch and I'm looking at birds I'm like I'll have to try and remember was that yesterday or is that today or was that last week or it just goes on and on sometimes um, so yeah so all about birds is one of the easiest ways to brush up on your bird identification skills um, I will also do a shameless plug for our other webinars our birding 101 and intermediate birding are also good resources for how to ID birds and then um, another one that I'll talk about a little bit later that we have coming up is another good resource. But on the next slide, I do want to show that there are um, other resources besides eBird. Um, one way to get involved with scientists and other birders in our community is the MoBirds listserv. I'll put that up in the chat shortly. Um, it's a really active community of people that keep track of or make notes and comments of what birds are in our area or what rare findings there are or any sort of events going on such as information like this, the CBC here, it says in the slide, which is the Christmas bird count. That's an event that happens every year. There's a bunch of um, people go out to different sites and record birds around Christmas time. It's not strictly on Christmas. So for more information about that, you can look on the listserv or just, I think if you Google Christmas bird count, you'll find out more about Christmas bird counts in your area. Again, that's not just a Missouri thing, but our, our listserv does reference the ones in our area. Um, generally, there are also more birding trips that are advertised. We can go learn more about birds or go find a place to go report birds with other people. Um, and they will generally point out interesting finds and then other interesting bird related stuff. Um, it is run by the nonprofit uh, Missouri Bird Society, which you can also join to stay up to date. Um, and just like that, there are many other similar nonprofit conservation groups, just like ours as well. Um, and local Audubon chapters are another good resource for citizen science and bird related scientific data. Um, another event that goes on regularly is the Great Backyard Bird Count. The one actually, a couple, there was one just a few weeks ago and it's actually exactly what it sounds like. You look at your backyard and you count the birds that are there and then you report your findings and then they do a whole um, analysis. They collect all the data for one day and share what everybody found. Like it, they can break it down by state, by county, the, um, I, actually, I believe that is also a Cornell event, but it's slightly different than just the generic eBird events. Uh, Project Feeder Watch is another one. All of these events, uh, Feeder Watch, Nest Watch, are other events that go on that highlight um, specific goals of bird watching in your area to help contribute to science. Um, iNaturalist is another one. It's another citizen science repository. It's not Cornell, if I recall. And it's actually more broad than just um, just birds. You can report anything on there and they have some pretty good tools for helping with identification if you don't know what you're finding. If you report something, you can add it on there and then it can be edited later with an accurate um, analysis or an accurate identification of the species that it is. So you can use things, iNaturalist is good for things um, including plants and, and bugs and other things other than just birds. But they also have a good um, list of birds on there as well. 
And then the last thing I wanted to mention on here is our MoBird song site, our last uh, webinar, Sound Science, Introduce It. That'll also be a place to help work on bird song ID um, and bird call IDs, so all the birds' sounds that birds make. And then also we have a forum that's on there that'll help try and engage the general public with scientists like us and others in our area and in promoting citizen science. And then lastly, Facebook, Facebook bird groups are, and then other social media and other bird groups are all, all exist, of course, too. There are easy ways to communicate with other scientists and the global birding community. So I think that's all I had. I will turn it back over to Dana to talk about advocacy. Um. Okay, so one of the things that we've seen um, in talking to people about these various seven steps um, is some people say, hey, I'm already doing all those things. Um, so what would you recommend? And if you're already doing all those seven things in one way or another, that's incredibly awesome, A. Um, but this is one thing that you can do is, is to be a, a more vocal advocate for birds. So I gave an example here of um, a screenshot from, from Audubon, um, National Audubon Society, you can sign up with them and they will send you alerts about various um, bird conservation issues and they're great about it and they have a lot of different webinars of their own about um, how to be an effective advocate. Um, so also though on the more local level, we have a number of really, really excellent organizations here in the state of Missouri that um, are involved in conservation policy advocacy on a very regular basis. Um, Missouri Coalition for the Environment and Stream Teams United. Um, there are others as well. I just personally find that these folks really are good at, at keeping you informed by email um, in a really clear fashion about issues that have to do with natural resources and wildlife. So I really like doing things with them. Um, a simple thing to do is tell your friends and family. Um, you know, birds are actually kind of an easy thing to work with and to advocate for because almost everyone likes birds. <laughs> I've met very few people that are like, they might be like a little afraid of them or something, but no one, no one dislikes birds. So I always feel very fortunate that I'm not trying to get people to, you know, really like venomous spiders or something like I think that'd be a much harder ask right um but basically telling your friends and family that that might not have any of these things on their radar um whether it be you know birds hitting buildings or um shade grown coffee or any of it tell tell folks that you know about these things and we can all help um so kind of getting more involved in in more active and vocal advocacy work, writing letters to the editor of your local newspaper is a really, really important um, step, civic step that people can take as citizens um, to, to make issues known to a much wider audience than would normally um, receive information about those things. Call and write your elected officials. Um, as conservationists, we often have people talk to us about things going on at the federal level um, as far as environmental policy. And um, I, I don't, personally, I don't have much sway over that. Um, I, I don't think people should forget that a lot of decisions that are really, really important as far as bird conservation and wildlife conservation are made at the state and local levels. So engage with those officials um, and then, and go see them as well. Um, you know, obviously the, the current pandemic situation has, has limited our options in terms of face-to-face -face meetings, but hopefully that will be different um, next year when the Missouri legislature starts again in January. Um, but, but seeing folks and just saying, hey, you know what, I really like birds and wildlife. I'm not suggesting that anybody be, you know, contentious or um, aggressive or anything, but just say, hey, I really, I really like birds. I really like wildlife. I'm concerned about their conservation. It can be as simple as that. So to end with a quote from one of my favorite historical figures, um, we've got to speak for the birds that we all really like because they can't do it for themselves. And I believe we have a fun, cute slide to enter into our question and answer. So I'm gonna turn it over to, well, actually, I think we're all going to answer questions, but I'm going to turn it over to 
Paige and or Zeb who look like they're already administering questions. Yeah, so that photo is by Tom Tucker, who is also on this webinar. <laughs> so thanks, Tom. <laughs> From, I believe, his backyard in the Kansas City area. So brown thrasher, really cool bird that can be seen uh, wherever you are. Yes, yeah, so we've started, um, so we have, just to start off with, we have about four minutes left till 6.30. So we'll be answering questions until that time. And we'll stick around later than that to answer questions. So if you guys have them, please post them either in that Q&A button or in the chat box. Um, we already have had a few questions that um, people have asked throughout the webinar. So we'll address those now in the chat box. And I believe Ethan has one that he's just itching to answer for you guys. So. I'll let him go ahead and do that. Or I can here, I can repeat the question too. That might be helpful. <laughs> Let's see, where does it go? So um, what regulations do bird seed producers have in regard to pesticides? This was the question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Perfect question, right in line with what I was talking about there. Um, that would be something that people would normally be concerned with. Is there these sort of neonics and these pesticides and things? In the in our bird seeds, that we're actually harming the birds and, and insects we're trying to benefit. Um, this came up actually kind of recently because there was an article saying that this could possibly be a thing. I think it was in the New York Post or something like that. Um, and uh, other bird organizations just sort of jumped on it right away and said, "Oh my goodness, that's probably a good concern. What's going on with that?" And and what they what they found is it's very unlikely if there was even some a little bit in your bird seed um, you'd have a lot of dead birds just showing up around your yard it's that it's that bad for them um, so <clears throat> i mean it, it would affect them indirectly just as does elsewhere in a landscape um, so if you wanted to ensure it and make sure what can you do to make sure that the producers aren't doing this through some form of regulation or otherwise um ironically it, it's making certain that birdseed doesn't have uh these these neonics in it would be making you'd have to have higher standards than we do for our own food and drinking water <laughs> and so that's it's pretty amazing but that's uh our, our regulations have been really just uh cut back and there's just I mean, there's not a lot of enforcement out there currently. So to even to try to do this for a bird seed, heck, heck we can't even do it for humans yet. But um, it's a great question. Um, so far, so good on the not having uh, neonics in our, in, our, in our bird seed. But um, I'm, I'm sure it would be detrimental for those in the industries if they did start producing that. Um, that being said, always, always look at what is recommended by um, People knowledgeable in the industry, I always refer to my friends at Stephen Regina Gar at Bird's Eye View in Jefferson City. They always have good advice on bird seed um, and sourcing. And um, I think Cornell Lab Ornithology has some good advice on that as well. But it's a great thing to keep in mind. But don't be don't be too worried about that. So I hope that answers your question. I think that answers that pretty well. Um, so another question is that I think Zeb wants to answer is how can you tell if coffee is shade grown? Is there always a branding slash stickers that shows that it is? And before Zeb like goes into that, I just want to say that I did um, share that link with you guys about the Smithsonian website, the national zoo that has the like where, where to buy bird friendly coffee. Like I gave you guys that website <laughs> link there. Yeah, so that really is the answer to this question. I guess it's part of the answer. So Paige said that that Smithsonian website, they're the ones that designed the bird friendly designation. Um, there are separate designations for just shade grown. And I think a couple of different companies have their own different logos for shade grown. And if you recall back in our presentation, we have that, that gradient of different scales of shade grown. Not all shade grown necessarily means it's bird friendly, but most of those things are um, they're not stickers. I think they're usually like printed onto the packaging and they'll, they'll advertise it as bird friendly. And that's one of the, the perks of it is if it is a bird friendly thing, they put that stamp on there so they can ask for a little bit more to compensate to make up for um, going through the hurdles of having a healthy landscape and having sustainable um, coffee grown. So, but yeah, like the, so the Smithsonian website that page linked is really going to answer what ones are listed as bird friendly. 
and then most of them have some sort of writing, whether they're shade grown, shade grown or not too. I did a, a kind of a deep dive on this after our, our practice yesterday too, because I was looking up new coffees to try because I'm also a coffee addict. Um, so I, I figured that since I was just looking at them all yesterday, there's a bunch of different logos on there, but the one that says Smithsonian Bird Friendly is going to be your best bet for what we're, we're suggesting. Right. Because like we're saying, it's like, it's not just like shade grown. It's also organic and fair trade and like all this other really good stuff. Um, and, and I guess a good general rule of thumb with like things that are environmentally friendly nowadays is if that packaging is not screaming at you that this is certified, you know, this stuff, it probably isn't. <laughs> um, cause there, cause it like, as I've said, you kind of do have to go through hurdles to get that um, certification. So they're going to let you know. <laughs> Um, but that's a great question. And I love bird friendly coffee. Everyone should just go do that right after this webinar. <laughs> um, and let, I'm just going to scroll through. If you guys put the questions in the Q&A box, it's a lot easier for us to tell um, and make sure we'll get to it. So I just answered by typing in the Q&A box and I think everybody can see it. So um, Darla had a question about helping birds that have hit windows. Um, can everyone, I think, see that? I, th I, it, I didn't answer it anonymously, so um, there's some info on that or some suggestions on yeah. that. So it doesn't show up in the recording, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Oh, okay. um, so we have a lot of birds, Darla says, we have a lot of birds that hit windows at our house, and if they are just stunned, my husband will pick them up and pet them until they get their wits about them. I assume this isn't harmful. We love the ideas of making glass birds safe. Um, yeah, so definitely prevention is great. And so Dana responds, <laughs> um, keeping stunned birds in a quiet, dark location like a shoe box is probably better than petting them. That's a wonderful sentiment and we always want to do this, but I think in most cases the birds will not understand that we are trying to give comfort and it will stress the bird out even more. If you have lots of birds hitting your windows, you might want to look into the window alert stickers or some of the do-it-yourself window treatments. Sometimes even closing blinds at specific times of day when windows are most reflective will help a bit. Great, yes. Um, I think all around that's great advice and a great question because um, I get that question all the time. Um, and with my rehab background um, with wildlife rehab, it yeah, like birds, like it's so tempting to just be like, oh my gosh, you're okay, it's okay. But they do get stressed out by us holding them and being near them and our voices. And so um, having them in like, and we recommend like something made out of cardboard because cardboard is a softer material than like a plastic container. So if they're like thrashing around and hitting their wings on something, they're not also gonna break their wings um, inside your box. Um, so yeah, just letting them sit for a little bit um, can be super helpful. Okay. I'll jump in here too. So Paige hinted to it that we re-aired that question because it's going to be in the recording. And we had a question, yes, um, about whether these are going to be recorded on YouTube or on our website. And the answer is both. Um, we'll put it up on our YouTube page and then there'll be a page on our website specifically for this recording that has the YouTube video embedded in it. So if you look on our website in the webinar series, you'll find all of our past ones too, shameless plug. Um, to find our old webinars, and then on our YouTube page as well, they'll have all of the old webinars. Um, all right, I'm just seeing the chat right now. Okay. Go ahead, Eve. So it says, um, in the age of COVID, choose paper versus plastic bags when shopping. Reusable bags are not welcome at retail outlets. Well, there has been a surge of, of that sentiment of those not being welcome in certain retail outlets, especially early on during the COVID thing, because there was a lot of uncertainty and how it was really transmitted. Um, and also there's a lot of, of political push about this. So state legislatures, particularly in Illinois and elsewhere, were really happy to get, get rid of those plastic bag bans for a little while. And there's a lot of other environmental ways uh, politicians have been using COVID to, to dial back protections of of food and water and, and, and our environment. Uh, that's just kind of another one. Um, you, can, you can safely um, disinfect your reusable bags. Um, it's, it's what's really effective is, is using face masks or plastic barriers and things like that in, in the retail space. That, that seems to be the most effective means. 
Um, uh, of course, plastic bags can, can harbor um, some amount of virus load for a potentially longer periods of time than a cloth fabric could be. And uh, one thing about having your own bags is you know that you can disinfect them. You know that they, you can quarantine your bags for a while. Um, and so I, I know that's what people in my family do. Um, they, they make sure their own bags are sanitized. And, and it's a way to, to bring attention to the issue, to discuss it with that dialogue. People will try to politicize the issue, but you can always inform them and say, no, actually show me the research on how this is really more dangerous and not welcome. I'm, and I'm wearing my mask and I'm doing all the right things. So I hope that uh, answers your questions on that particular topic. I will add on to that. I know actually one of our stores in town doesn't let you usually reuse the bags, even if you bring them in because they do bag your groceries. Um, and then the person in the chat did suggest at least try and use paper bags if they're not going to, if they're going to require you to use a single use bag. I mean, you can reuse paper bags or use them for other purposes and they're a little more sustainable than, than the plastic bags. So if you do run into a situation where they won't let you use reusable bags, if you can at least still try and use paper bags. I think that's fair advice. Good point. And all research points to virus particles remaining on paper for far less time than on plastic. So, I mean, you could make that argument as well in your, in your shop, place of shopping. Yeah, yeah. if you didn't know this year, speaking of advocacy and, and Dana's great talk earlier on plastics, um, you know, that's something that if you're interested in advocacy, that's something that, that's going on in Jefferson City every year. Um, they want to ban bans on plastic bags. They, they see the writing on the wall. They know that the problem of plastics is happening. And the industry folks, you know, it'll be a, a hand, you know, uh, maybe three people from industry um, at these hearings and uh, many members of the public taking time off to be there. And of course, they'll Jefferson City, they've listened to the industry folks every single year for every hearing we've been there. So you can go and add your voice there, write to them, call them, tell them you see what they're doing. Yeah, so uh, as far as reducing plastics use goes, um, my personal journey with reducing my plastics use, I personally think for me, that's the hardest one on this seven simple step list. And for other people that may not be true, um, but for me it 100% was. And I highly recommend, for me what ended up working the best was me like doing it little by little, like choosing and being like, this is something I'm using like every day and it's plastic and how do I replace this? And then like looking up on the internet, okay, what are, cause there are a lot of non-plastic options for a lot of the things. And like, and doing it slowly and like, like toothpaste tubes and look at, and I think grocery bags is a, maybe, maybe now is not the best time, but I think any time is a great time to get started with that. Um, especially cause you're much more conscious about your grocery bags now. So you're le more likely to remember to bring in your reusable bags. Um, cause I think that is probably the hardest part of learning to use reusable bags is remembering to bring them in the store with you. But I find that it helps if you're like, I'm not going to use plastic bags. And if I forget them, then I have to buy more reusable bags. <laughs> um, but, you know, everybody has. But I, I guess my point, sorry, I'm rambling. But my point is with this is don't like just do a little bit at a time. Like it is a journey. And like, especially with these other things and start with something simple and you'll grow and you'll grow and you'll grow. <laughs> Absolutely. And to add to that, we, there is also a comment um, from Linda. You can also just put the groceries directly in your cart, and then when you get to your car, put them in your own bags in your car if you're in a situation where there's restrictions. Um, but to speak to Paige's comments just now, one of the things that has happened, and it, it's only recently been brought to my attention, I'm not like it's not like I'm like the all-knowing person on this topic um but I've learned it from other organizations um national and like more local that we work with and why I'm so into like everybody watching this movie the story of plastic is because this is how it's been framed it's been framed that it's the consumer choice and if you're not reducing your use in plastic then you should feel bad about it and it's your fault 
And I mean, that's been going on for a couple of decades, right? So, and, you know, in something like this virus pandemic, there are some really, really crucial, important medical uses for plastic. So it's not, we're not, no one is saying like, like we need to abolish all of it immediately. But the, the idea that it's all your personal choice and it's all your personal responsibility is not, it, it, that's not a true narrative. Like that's not a real thing. So there are so many things that they're like, if <laughs> there's either no alternative or it's really expensive or it's really hard to find or it's, it's, it's not as functional. And so I think the movement at this point is that, that more and more citizens are becoming aware of, and certainly that a lot of organizations are becoming aware of, is that we need to work together to have the environmentally friendly and sustainable alternatives be the norm, not the thing that we all have to like go to these enormous and sometimes expensive lengths to deal with. You know, I'm non obviously like we put that slide up there, you know, Audubon's eight steps are our personal actions. Um, personal responsibility is good. It's a thing like we all need to do it. Yeah, but you can't like you yourself cannot change the horrible plastic problem in this world. Like even if you did manage to abolish all plastics from your own life, like we have got to we've got to turn it off at the source. Like we've got to address that. So. Sorry, I'm rambling also because I'm very passionate on this topic. <laughs> no, I 100% agree with what you were saying, Dana. And I think you said it very eloquently. <laughs> I got it from the story of plastic. <laughs> I just, it's, it's, my eyes have been open in the last year. Like how much more plastic is being produced, how little is recycled, and how little we can really do about it on like just an individual level and that we've been told that that's the only solution. Awesome. Okay. So as you can tell, like I said at the very beginning before I do, like just dropped off the face of the earth, um, we're, this is something that means a lot to us. I really love these simple actions because they just speak to learning more about what um, birds go through and how you can help them in like ways that seem overwhelming at first, but when you break them down, make them a lot more simple. So I'm really glad that all of you were able to join us today. And I'm especially proud of the people still on this. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Um, oh, I just saw one Q and A pop up. Oh, just bravo to us. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we're about 645 here. I think we'll kind of wrap it up, but thank you guys all for joining us. We really appreciate it and share with your friends if you can. We'll see you next time.